my favorite quotes about music goes like this. For heights and depths no words can reach, music is the soul's own speech. My mom made an embroidery of this, and it has instruments all around it, and it's prominently posted in our family living room. And it reminded us as children, and as young teens growing up and taking music lessons, that music has a power to convey what is deepest in our hearts, that sometimes words fail us, but the music has this transcendent ability. It, it transports us, it lifts us up, it expresses us and our emotions in ways that words, some, sometimes they just fail us. Well, the Israelites are discovering how powerful song can be. Take out this earring here because it's clicking on my microphone. Now, we haven't talked about the Exodus story for a couple of weeks, so let me catch you back up with where we are in the story. Remember, they were, the Israelites were oppressed in Egypt. They were there for 400 years, and Moses led them through the Red Sea after having confronted Pharaoh, after having God sweep the army away that was coming after them, they are now on the other side, and this is a pivot point for the Israelites. Something has changed for them. They are now free people. They are no longer slaves. They have come on the other side of a great ordeal. They have, in a sense, passed through the birth waters, and they are reborn as a new free nation. So this song that you heard Herb read and that is sung still among the Jewish people, this is their birth song. This is the birth of their nation. And it reminds me of the song that we sing about the birth of our nation. What is the song that we all sing at the beginning of every football game and every baseball game? What do we sing? Star Spangled Banner. And what happens when people sing that song or when the band plays it? What do people do? They stand up and they put their hand over their heart and the gentlemen are supposed to <coughs> take off their hats. Sometimes they don't do that anymore, do they, right? But you're supposed to, now why do we do, why do we put our hand over our heart? Why do we stand up? Why do we take off our hat? Why do we do that? It's a sign of respect, right? I was at the football game from Milton. I've been to a lot of them, and it's really interesting to watch what happens when the Star Spangled Banner plays. You know, there's lots of activity at a football game. There's kids playing, there's people talking, there's the band, there's, there's people selling things in the, at, the, at the food stand. But when that song plays, what happens? Everything stops. And everybody turns to the flag, they stand up, put their hand over the heart, and if they don't sing, which you're supposed to sing when it's playing, right? You're supposed to sing, but you're at least supposed to listen and to be respectful. Because that song signifies and reminds us that we are one nation. We are a people that are united. We are united under that flag. And that song brings us all together. Well, that's what's happening for the Israelites. The song that you read, which we don't know what the, what the melody was for them back then. We don't know because we didn't have any recording equipment, but we do know that the, the women came out with their tambourines and Miriam, Moses' sister, is leading them. And where, whenever they sang that song from that point on, you can be assured that everybody stopped whatever they were doing. They stood up. And they praised God for making them a united and free people. It reminds me of another song that African Americans will often sing. Get out your hymnal. And I want you to turn to number 841. The song, Lift Every Voice and Sing is the song of freedom for African Americans. And 
For African Americans, the, the, the story of the Exodus resonates with them so strongly because they too were slaves in this country and in England for hundreds of years. And so when the Emancipation Proclamation happened on that New Year's night back in 1863, they experienced the birth, the rebirth of their people. Read these words. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. It's a re reminiscent of the, of the seed there, the seed that they had come through, just like the Israelites. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. So that marching song, just like the Israelites marching through the Red Sea, African Americans, when they sing the song, you can be sure they are all standing up. They are all joining their voices. They're singing in harmony because this song is not just about the birth of a people. It is about the birth of freedom, freedom from oppression, freedom to worship God the way God intended for you to worship without shackles on your feet and to be able to praise God for your own body, for your breath, for your life. Martin Luther also loved music. How many of you have your smartphones with you? Not yeah, your smartphones. I want you to Google Martin Luther quotes about music. Martin Luther quotes about music. There are two really good quotes that Martin Luther says about music. When you think you found a good quote from Martin Luther about music, raise your hand and I'll come out and see what you said, what you've got. While you're looking, let me tell you that for Martin Luther, music was the thing that soothed his soul when he was beset with depression and worry, when he was facing the trial at the, the, the uh, diet of Worms. Okay, Ken's got one. All right, Ken, read it out loud for us, nice and loud. Next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. Next to the word of God, music is the greatest treasure. That's how highly Martin Luther held music in regard. Luther wrote hymns. If you find another one that's related to Martin, okay, go ahead, Ted, what do you got? Next to theology, I give music the highest place of honor. Wow, that's pretty big. Theology is the study of God, so music is right underneath that. He believed that music could unite people. That's why he wrote hymns. That's why he went into the bars. You know this? Martin Luther went into the bars and he listened to the songs that they were singing and he took those melodies and he wrote religious words for them. Did you know that about Martin Luther? Did you know Martin Luther liked to have a beer? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's not Baptist, right? <laughs> so Martin Luther. He knew that if you want to get people together and feeling like they are united and singing the songs that they know and love, go ahead and sing the popular music. That's okay to do. That's why we have Youth Sundays where we're singing upbeat music and we got the drums and the guitars and organ is good too. This, there is no bad music. Okay? There could be bad lyrics. Okay? There could be bad lyrics. But there is no bad music. You can make praising of God through rap music, country music, classical music, Christian music, whatever, African music, Japanese music, any of the music itself is all a gift from God. Anybody else got another quote from 
Okay, go ahead, Nick. Beautiful music is the art of the prophet that can calm the agitations of the soul. It is the one, it is one of the most magnificent and delightful presents God has given us. Right. So why did Martin Luther know this? Because Martin Luther battled with depression. Right? He battled with depression. He was facing so many trials in his life, and he was always worried that he was not doing enough. He was always worried that he was that God was not going to accept him. And music became the way that he experienced release, that he felt soothed and comforted by God. That's one of the reasons why Protestants sing so much in church. Okay? Because before this time, what were they singing in the churches? Anybody know what came before hymns? Gregorian chant. Whoever said, who raised their hand? Okay, yes, our seminarian knows that. Right? Gregorian chant is hard to sing. You don't see too many Gregorian chants in our hymn, do you? No, because they're hard to sing. So when people came to church, they were listening to the trained professional singers sing these Gregorian chants, but they would just sit there and listen. Martin Luther said, no, the people of God are supposed to sing. The people of God are all supposed to get communion. The people of God are supposed to learn to read the Bible themselves. All of these things that Luther taught us are meant to fill us with praise of God and connect us with faith in God. That's why we sing so much in church. We have an opening hymn. We sing the song of praise and the Kyrie. We sing the song after the sermon. We sing during communion sometimes. We're singing all the time. Now, not many of you, though, will sit or consider yourself professional singers. How many of you consider yourself professional singers? What? None? Okay. But you all still sing, don't you? Well, some of you sing. Some of you sing. <laughs> I have to say, last week when we sang um, uh, for All Saints Sunday, um, and we had the men's verse and we had the women's verse, I have to tell you, it was pretty sad. It was pretty sad. So I think we need to remind ourselves why it is important to sing. And remember, the psalm says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't say make a joyful singing on pitch to the Lord. You don't have to sing on pitch. You just have to make a joyful noise. Noise is, as long as something's coming out of your mouth, that's making God happy, okay? So I want us to practice for something. I want you to open to Martin Luther's most famous hymn, which, where's the confirmation student? Larissa? Where is Larissa? Where did she go? She went downstairs. She went downstairs. All right. Brianna, what is Martin Luther's most famous hymn? Do you remember? No. No. <laughs> Where's my... No seminarians already. Okay, Owen, what is it? Come on, we just talked about it last week. A mighty fortress is our God. All right, so I want you to turn in your hymnal to page 504. Okay? And we are going to practice, and this is actually going to be our hymn of the day, the uh, uh, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. We're going to sing that for communion. But we're going to practice singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to show respect, so we're going to stand up. Stand up. And the other reason we stand up when we sing <coughs> is because your lungs can fill to the proper level when you are standing up. When you're sitting, your lungs are compressed. When you stand up, you can take a deep breath and it fills your lungs and then you can blast that song out, okay? Now, I want the men, we really got to work on the men singing here. We've got to get the men's voices booming out because when we don't have that bass and tenor there, it's like the, there's no basis there. There's, there, there's no foundation for our singing. So I just need a C, okay? A mighty fortress is our God. Okay, that was so weak, like three-day-old tea, all right? <laughs> You're t let, let, listen, you are talking about God, the mighty fortress who brought the Israelites out through the Red Sea, who freed the slaves, who made you a church. Yeah. Mm. No! You are singing praise to God. Make it worthy of God's presence. All right, let's try that again. Ready? Deep breath. Almighty fortress is our God. Good, stop. All right, now let's do the women. Well, that was okay. 
okay, let's not take the organ away, actually. I want to hear the women's voices, all right? And when you sing, you also, you need to bellow it out. You need to take a deep breath. And I said, do not care if you think that you are not singing in pitch, because here's the nice thing about singing in a congregation. There's so many people singing around you, nobody's going to care. <laughs> They're going to cover you up. That's one of the reasons why we sing as a congregation, because you can feel the vibrations of your lungs and your vocal cords and your nasal passages, all of that. You yourself are singing a note, but you are joining with lots of other people. It is individual and communal at the same time. So ladies, let's try this again. Oh, sword and shield victorious. That's much better. All right, men. He breaks the cruel oppressor's power. That's better. And women? And win salvation glorious. Now all together. The old satanic foe has sworn to It fills the air around you with joy. When you are sad, you can sing songs of lamentation. African Americans would sing, nobody knows the trouble I seen. When we sing, no matter what emotion we're feeling, it transcends that. It transports us and it connects us with each other. So when you're in church, you are Lutherans, you have the Lutheran heritage. I want to hear you sing. I want the rafters to shake. I don't care whether it's on pitch or in perfect four-part harmony. I just want to hear some. I want to feel the vibrations from this Lutheran church singing praise to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. A mighty fortress is our God. We'll continue with verse 2. Verse 2. 